So we're going to get into something more conventional, uh, something more like the stuff we would normally do. We're going to be doing some extra history. Should be fun. We have the Boston Massacre. This is a one off. So we're just doing one episode. Uh, Boston Massacre, snow and gunpowder. If you don't know about the Boston Massacre, it's it's a really important event leading up to the American Revolution. It, it, oh, bye, Blue Wolf. Thank, thank you for hopping in today. Um, so it's going to be a really... It's going to be interesting. Let's just get it started and we'll talk as it goes along, as we do. Boston, 1770. A frigid winter night. Sounds of a fight echo on King Street. A British sentry strikes a local citizen, and other citizens begin to gather. Reinforcements arrive to back up the young sentry. Then, someone rings the fire bell, drawing more people out into the streets. The crowd shouts insults. They throw snowballs and sharp hunks of ice. Outnumbered mm. and overwhelmed, the- So this is another thing. The, the Boston Massacre, it has really been shaped in the public consciousness by a particular image. Let me just pull it up right now because I have the internet and we can. Uh, Boston Massacre. There we go. So, here we go. Uh, this one. This image we got right here, it is uh, an engraving of the Boston Massacre from Paul Revere, who is a figure that you may be familiar with from Paul Revere's ride, where he comes in and he's, where the British are coming, the British are coming, even though that story has been butchered to death. It's that guy. Um, so he played a huge role and he was like kind of the bridge between the upper class and the ordinary people. He was great for messaging. He created this really interesting image here. Uh, and and you, you see it. It's like the British people, they're opening fire. Uh, people are sort of like leaning away from the fire. These are people who are portrayed as in retreat. We have people suffering on the floor. These guys are just trying to help this person and they're still firing and this person's got a sword and he's leading them. He's condoning this. This is by order of, of an unjust government. We need to fight them or something. Uh, but nothing in that image indicated that the people were a mob. Nothing indicated that they had the potential to be violent. Nothing indicated that they were throwing stuff at the soldiers. It really doesn't give a full picture of it, but it's sort of, uh, you do whatever you can to justify the ends that you believe are best. If you have to de deceive the people a little bit to rile them up in favor of revolution, that's what you do. That That's how somebody would have justified it, even if it is a little bit dishonest. Very dishonest. Let, let's not sugarcoat it. It's very dishonest. Soldiers fix bayonets. Their breath mists the air. Everything is chaos, noise, and flying ice. Then, out of the darkness comes a shout. Fire! And there's ambiguity here. Who said fire? Where did it come from? Was it from behind? Was it from the front? Was it which? Was it from somewhere in the crowds? Did somebody say to fire? Did somebody say hold your fire? There, there's ambiguity here. It, it seems that somebody could have called for it or there could have been a misunderstanding that triggered this this is why this is such an enigmatic event because there's there's some layers to it there's at least two layers in the 17th century england sent out ships to colonize america but they weren't the only ones dutch swedish and french also made claims on the continent and in the 18th century, England fought a series of costly wars to protect their overseas conquests. 
But defending all those colonies and colonists cost money. A mm. lot of money. So in a bid to balance the books, British leadership decided that the colonists should help pay the cost of their defense. The American colonists were not pleased. Here's the interesting thing here. We, we haven't actually talked about this for a while. So I may end up repeating some stuff that you've heard me talk about in previous videos, but since it has been a little while, I'll bring up some of the typical terms. Um, this is a result of something that we call salutary neglect. So when the colonies were established, they were sort of on their own. They were doing their own thing. They set up their own governments. They had their own trade systems or whatever, and the British were sort of cool with it. They didn't run it super directly, but they benefited from the trade and the resources and all that that came from it. So it's like, hey, they do their thing as long as we're still making money. That's fine. And they would still end up making money from colonial trade and all that. However, after the war, they're kind of in a bad way. So they decide, hey, we're going to start taxing them in a more direct fashion. Okay, but these people are not accustomed to paying taxes like that. They're not accustomed to you asserting your power over them. It's been a long time since these colonies have been established and they've been sort of doing their own thing for a while and you're telling them we're going to be doing things differently now? It's because the colonists were so used to doing things a certain way and, to, and one day uh, the British government gets up and is just like, okay, we need money. It's time for you guys to start being real British subjects and do things a different way from how you've been accustomed to doing it for so long. And that's the problem with salutary neglect. It makes people accustomed to a certain way of doing things and harder to change. So they're going to react more angrily because of that. Should help pay the cost of their defense. The American colonists were not pleased. And though each of the 13 colonies had different lifestyles and customs, their leading inhabitants all began to unite in their displeasure at their faraway government. Then in 1765, the government imposed the Stamp Act, requiring colonial paper goods to be printed on sheets made in London and marked with a special stamp. This included things like newspapers, playing cards, and legal documents. In And you notice the commonality there. This included newspaper, playing cards are one thing. That That's maybe a little bit more of an ordinary person thing. But newspapers and legal documents. So what's the significance of that? Well, newspapers, those are the people who get the information out there. You don't want to make the people who, who print the information angry because they're the types of people that if you make them angry, they could lead a huge propaganda campaign against you. They, they could spread the word. You want them on your side and now you've turned them against you. And then there's legal documents. So lawyers and people who are involved deeply in the law more likely to be wealthy or whatever oof you, you've angered some you, you've angered some powerful people if you anger ordinary people that's one thing they have power of numbers but now you've meant angered people who have the power of uh information and the power of wealth. Things like newspapers, playing cards, and legal documents. In other words, it hit the most influential people in American society. Am I right in saying Ben Franklin agreed in Parliament to pay the taxes if the colonies got representation? Um, ben Franklin, he didn't seem like he... F he was sort of in this weird in-between where he said, like, he didn't... The colonies don't like the particular way that you're taxing them, but... It seems that the colonies just didn't like being taxed in general by Parliament. So I think Ben Franklin was kind of selling a more moderate version of America to the British Parliament. Maybe one that didn't fully reflect what the reality was, but that's just what it seemed like to me. Society. 
newspaper owners, lawyers, tavern keepers, and merchants. In addition, Parliament had bypassed colonial legal systems and directly levied many taxes on the colonists. This arguably violated the 1689 English Bill of Rights, which stated that levying taxes without the assent of Parliament was illegal. And though parliamentary representation for the colonies had been discussed, no one had ever worked out a plan that satisfied both the colonists and Parliament. Mm. As a result, cries of no taxation without representation rang through the colonies. There was little real agreement, but many colonists found common ground in resisting the idea that Americans should pay for a war that Britain had fought for its own benefit. The government, on the other hand, saw the colonists as spoiled, even with a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. You know, it, the, the British government benefited immensely from the colonies and their goods and whatever. Uh, and the colonists were not exactly uh, perfectly accustomed to paying taxes and they may have been a little bit spoiled. However, at the same time, the, the British government weren't really willing to give much ground to the colonies because they still sort of looked down upon them they were sort of like less than uh they, they were never fully considered quite uh quite the same as lane mainland british uh at least from the perspective of a lot of mainland british people what would representation do for the colonies who had a smaller population maybe they could form a coalition with more popular parties if they agreed to implement favorable politics. Well, what they really wanted was their own. In reality, what it seemed like a lot of them wanted was their own sort of parliament. Like there was like, there would be like a colonial parliament and it would be underneath the king, but not under the mainland parliament. It would be sort of horizontal is existing alongside the main parliament so the colonies would make decisions for themselves the regular parliament would make decisions for the mainland uh but that's something that they would never get that would be a big ask with the new levies they had lower taxes than most englishmen at home and frequently more rights not to mention the seven years war had been fought to defend the colonists land for pete's sake so Parliament ignored the protests, passed more taxes, and sent troops to protect its officials and enforce the new laws, forcing the colonists to pay for housing and feeding them. Soon, resentment boiled between the- And, and uh, that was the Quartering Act. So, uh, a British person, a British soldier specifically, could knock on your door and be like, oh, okay, you're feeding us and housing us tonight, and that's why we have, uh, uh, it in in the uh, uh, in the Bill of Rights, one of the first, not one of the first things, but it, like in the beginning, like weirdly early, it says like the the army can't sleep in your house, <laughs> like weirdly early, and it feels weird to us, but it, it was important at the time. The colonists and soldiers. And in late February, a mob gathered outside a customs official's house and began throwing stones through his windows. The official fired a pistol at the crowd and fatally wounded an 11-year-old boy. 2,000 people attended the funeral. Then, on March 2nd, 1770, a group of British soldiers passed some local workers. The soldiers have been there several months, and after the mass funeral, tensions are at a peak. One of the workers insults a soldier, who responds by striking him with his musket. A fight That's police out, brutality. spiraling into a riot, as many more workers and soldiers pile in. Outnumbered, the soldiers retreat to Jeers. It's a prelude. Three days later, a wig maker's apprentice taunts a British officer. A private standing outside of the customs house calls out that the apprentice should be more respectful. They exchange insults. The apprentice pokes the officer in the chest, and the private loses his patience and clubs the apprentice with his musket stock. That the is also police brutality. And the situation deteriorates. Someone rings the church bell, signaling fire. Civilians, confused, pour into the streets. 50 Bostonians, led by Crispus Attucks, a free man of African and Native American heritage, press around the private. He retreats to the steps of the customs house, calling for help. 
seven soldiers, led by Captain Thomas Preston, come to his aid. They push their way through the crowd and form a semicircle on the steps, muskets loaded and bayonets fixed. They're surrounded. So yeah, this is almost certainly a mob. I think we can recognize that this is a mob. And uh, that is something that the founding fathers uh, were very concerned about, despite the fact that they utilize mob tactics, or maybe because they utilize mob tactics a lot. Um, they knew how dangerous the mob could be. Founded by several hundred people, some armed with rope makers clubs. The crowd throws snowballs, ice, and razor sharp oyster shells. They chant, fire. fire! You gotta remember, this is Boston. Everybody carries around an oyster shell in their pocket. Fire, fire. A merchant, Richard Palmer, asks Preston if he intends to order his men to shoot. Preston replies that he will not. After all, would he order them to shoot while he's standing in the front, in the line of fire? Just then, from the darkness behind the soldiers, someone shouts, fire. At that same moment, something strikes one of the soldiers, knocking him down. When he rises, he fires. The others fire a ragged volley, one at a time. Mm. Preston shouts for them to halt. The soldiers comply, confused. Hadn't he given the order? With dawning horror, they realize what's happened. Three civilians, including addicts, lay dead in the snow. Two more will die that night. The injured cluster around the customs house steps. The crowd surges away, but continues to gather in nearby streets. Reinforcements arrive along with the governor. Enraged citizens force him inside the state house, and from the balcony, he promises that if they disperse, there will be a proper inquiry and trial. Appeased, the crowd begins to break up. Well, there we Next go. Morning, Captain Preston and eight other soldiers are arrested. Despite the tragedy, they insist that what transpired was not a willful act of murder. They. I, I think most people, when they hear what we generally know about it, it clearly is a mass moment of confusion. And without having that ex the exact origins of it, it's hard to say. Uh, it could have just been somebody off to the side just recklessly throwing around their words. May I don't know. I, I don't know why any individual would do such a thing. We don't know who it was and what motivation they could have had. And could it have actually been the British's fault? Absolutely. Could it have, and is there an element of like legitimate self-defense that led up to this? Sure, with them gathering around and trying to defend somebody from a mob, like that's probably what they should be doing. So it's hard to condemn anybody super hard knowing as much as we do. They'd been outnumbered, threatened, and assaulted for hours. But public opinion didn't care. In the weeks following the massacre, British loyalists and Boston radicals fought a propaganda war. Paul Revere published an engraving showing the soldiers firing there it a is. coordinated volley into a peaceful, unarmed crowd. Both sides told vastly different stories of what took place. Loyalists insisted the citizens were to blame for refusing to follow British laws and radicals insisted the massacre was intentional, unprovoked attack designed to quell the spirit of liberty. Cla yeah, that that's sort of bull. <laughs> that's pretty bull. Like, there, there's one thing like, yeah, they weren't, as an American, yeah, they weren't following British laws and it the British had very little reason to just attack people completely unprovoked. Like, there was little to gain there. I understand when you give people positions of authority, sometimes they'll abuse it, and I'm sure it was abused in the lead up to it. Like, we know it was abused in the lead up to it. Uh, and that would have sort of created the anger of, uh, of the ordinary people that would cause them to lash out against the soldiers, that would lead to the mob, that would... Yeah, so this is a it's sort of a cycle of retaliation that exploded in this moment. Clashes continued between the citizens of Boston and British troops, and eventually the British withdrew the entire 29th Regiment from Boston in order to keep the peace. The governor postponed the trial until things calmed down, and in that lull, Boston had to decide. 
What would they do with the soldiers? What could justice look like? Hmm. And who would possibly take their case? And a lot of people were afraid of the soldiers being exported back to uh, England because they thought they wouldn't uh, be held accountable if they were sent back there to face justice. So people really fought hard to make sure that they were tried in Boston for the crime committed in Boston. They found their salvation in John Adams. Although an outspoken opponent of the Stamp Act, Adams was also dedicated to impartial enforcement of the law and presumption of innocence for the accused. Adams seemed perfect. His public opposition of the taxes meant no one could accuse him of being a rabid loyalist, but his dedication to legal impartiality meant he might be willing to take the case. Though it wasn't really an appealing deal for him. Taking the case would not only make him unpopular, it would also risk his legal practice. But Adam... Yeah, uh, John Adams is a very interesting individual. Samuel Adams, his cousin, uh, was... He's considered like a grand founding father, one of the earliest major figures that was associated with the movement ag agitated a ton for revolutionary action and then we have john adams who's a little bit more moderate um he's yes very principled and dedicated to the law and he's not afraid of being unpopular uh, he actually seems like he finds a degree of pride in being unpopular because he was he was very much anti-mob he was afraid of democracy he was afraid of the will of the mob he uh th th this was something like even like on principle he, this is not the way he would want things to go about like he doesn't want mobs to harass soldiers in the street that's not his idea of protest, I suppose. Adams believed every person deserved a defense, so he agreed to head the defense team. The day of the trial, Preston and his soldiers stand in a courtroom packed floor to ceiling. Adams encourages the jury to look beyond their prejudice and recognize that these men, outnumbered by an angry mob, had a right to self-defense. If he could prove that they'd been provoked, then they were guilty of manslaughter, not murder. The first witness takes the stand. Adams gets him to admit that he had carried a sword that night, planning to decapitate the soldiers. Other witnesses testify about the violent provocations the soldiers endured. A prosecution witness claims he saw Preston give an order to fire while standing behind his men. But Adams produces testimony from a witness who had had his hand on Preston's shoulder when the shooting started. That witness swears Preston never gave an order and was standing in front of the soldiers. Two more witnesses swear the shout of fire did not come from Preston. Testimony is over. Time for closing remarks. Adams shuffles his papers, takes a deep breath, and addresses the jury. I will enlarge no more on the evidence, he says, but submit it to you, gentlemen. Facts are stubborn things. And whatever may facts be are stubborn wishes, things. inclinations or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence, nor is the law less stable than the fact. If an assault was made to endanger their lives, the law is clear. They had right to kill in their own defense. Adams had made a persuasive case, but was it enough to open He was the good. Order, however justified of his- A lot of the founding fathers were lawyers. Um, Adams was particularly gifted in his knowledge of the law as like a cold thing. Like we have people like Thomas Jefferson. He also had a brief- law career and would be considered a lawyer jefferson was more uh into more abstract beautiful pretty ideas while uh john adams was very much a grounded dude so the argument sounds very in character right? based on everything else we know about him fellow colonists the jury deliberates for two and a half hours at stake is not only the soldiers lives but adam's reputation Finally, they deliver their verdict. Not guilty. Captain Did Ad Adams have input on the custom of innocent until proven guilty? No, no, no. That that that's completely separate from him, though he he definitely certainly subscribed to it. And Preston and six of his soldiers would be acquitted. Two were convicted of manslaughter, 
not murder, and branded on the thumb with an M. If they broke the law again, the mark would ensure a harsher sentence. The revolution was still years away, but the Boston Massacre had helped turn colonial sentiment against King George III, the government's tax policy, and the British Army. In the wake of the trial, Adam's legal business... Yeah, before... E even King George III, it took a while for people to turn on King George III. They were mostly against Parliament until uh, uh, Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, ended up circulating big time, which turned a lot of people against George III. But for most of uh, the lead-up to the revolution, they were, they were fine with him. They wanted the king to be in charge, not parliament. They wanted their own parliament under the king, sort of. Took a major hit, but his involvement in the case and his newfound reputation of impartiality, along with his skills as a narrator, made him an appealing voice in revolutionary circles. After all, if even a fair-minded man like Adams believed in the revolution, surely it wasn't so radical. Adams went on to be a delegate at the Colonial Congress and helped draft the Declaration of Independence. During the war, he served as a diplomat, helping gain naval support from France and negotiating the eventual peace treaty with Britain. And in the 1780s, while minister to Great Britain, he noticed a familiar face on the streets of London, Captain Thomas Preston. These two men, passing on the street, had helped ignite a revolution. Two men, now from different nations, linked by one event. No, dude, I want to know how that interaction went. I don't know about that. Oh, I want to know that conversation. <laughs> I hope that conversation happened. Maybe they just saw each other and passed by. Oh, that was, that was well done. As far as like covering the Boston Massacre in 10 minutes goes, I, I think that was a pretty good job. I think that was a uh, quite solid. Uh, I enjoy John Adams. He was a principled dude. He didn't always have the right principles. Uh, it's just opinion or whatever. He, he was uh, not always the... Uh, his judgment wasn't always the best. But I do sort of have a soft spot for him because he was... You could see there was a, a relatively consistent political philosophy. Uh, we have people like Jefferson who kind of saw where the wind blew a little bit more and kind of went that way sometimes uh it was but john adams believed the same thing on wednesday that he believed on monday no matter what happened on tuesday john adams was a consistent dude some would argue consistently awful, but that's for uh, that's for the realm of opinion, and I'll allow you to make your own judgment on how you feel there. I, I think he has some very strong qualities that I really enjoy, and then he has like areas where he's like not really super big into free speech during his time as a president. <laughs> that's not really cool. So that's a thing.